Welcome everyone to today's program. Uh, my name is Shannon. I'm with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time that we have and we'll follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce one of today's presenters. Sean Slavinsky was named the Chief Executive Officer of Care Innovations in October of 2013. A passionate thought leader in the healthcare and wellness industries, Sean is a proven innovator and entrepreneur with an established track record in defining and building businesses from concept to viability. Sean has demonstrated great success in building pioneer products that define and lead their market segment while being highly adept at building distribution channels on a national and international scale. Sean has held significant senior leadership roles within the industry most recently at Humana, serving as Segment Vice President of Humana's Health and Productivity Solutions Business Group. In this role, he led hundreds of employees in four industry-leading wellness businesses, aligning them into a common vision of bolstering expertise in population health and well-being. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Sean to begin today's presentation. Well, thank you very much. He sounds like a wonderful guy. I, I wish I knew him. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to this webinar. We're very excited to be presenting this to you today. You know, I did an experiment over the last week in all the meetings that I was in <clears throat> just to kind of test accountable care and how important and top of mind this is to people within the industry. And in 90% of all my meetings, without prompting, accountable care came up as part of the conversation at some point in the first 10 to 15 minutes. So we know this is on the top of everyone's mind as we shift from fee-for-service to more of an accountable care type system. Today's webinar, I think, is going to bring some wonderful education from our fantastic panelists. And also, we want to spend most of our time on question and answers so you can get the greatest value out of this time together today. Um, with that, uh, the nature of the webinar, everyone's going to do just a brief introduction of themselves, talk a little bit about who they are and where they came from, and give some perspective on uh, the situation within the industry that then leads to uh, how they're looking at accountable care within the space. And then we'll open it up to your questions. And then on that topic of introductions, and since we're sponsoring this, we get to put a plug in for ourselves. But I know that's not why you came, so I'll keep it very brief. So we can, we can advance to the next slide, please. And the next one. I will leave you with this before we jump into the time that you really want to spend. With Care Innovations, as you all think about your strategies around accountable care and how technology plays a role in reaching into the home or wherever your patients may be to make that more effective from an outcome and cost perspective, we'd appreciate it if you'd think of Care Innovations. We help our clients from the very beginning of just thinking about how to incorporate technologies to engage people in their homes all the way through analytics and logistics to deliver those services so that you can get the outcomes that you need. So as you're thinking of technology in the home, in accountable care, please give us a call. We'd be happy to work with you and share with you what we've learned. On to the next topic then, if we could go to the next slide. Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you and allow you to introduce yourself and take it from here. Great. Thanks, Sean. Uh, and thanks for having me today, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, this is Chris Daw, I'm a Managing Director at Evelyn Health. Uh, Evelyn is a healthcare company uh, based in Northern Virginia, which uh, partners with healthcare systems to uh, design, build, and operate in a long-term partnership format uh, their value-based businesses. Uh, we're working with partners uh, from all around the country. I'll just spend a few minutes at the end of my presentation talking a little bit about how we are uh, active in the uh, healthcare transformation space, the topic of our chat today. Uh, just a quick word about uh, my background. I started my career in the delivery system at Partners Healthcare uh, up in Boston, but spent much of the last decade here in Washington working in federal policymaking, 
uh, spent about five years in the Senate, most of that with the Senate Finance Committee, working on the development and passage of the Affordable Care Act. And from there, I transitioned to the executive branch and spent uh, the last three years at both HHS and the National Economic Council at the White House, uh, implementing the elements of the law that focus on imp uh, health system improvement uh, and driving affordability um, and, uh, and quality improvement. So what I wanted to uh, focus on today, if we could uh, click to the next slide, uh, are a few of the high level, at the national level, the high level public and private uh, sector forces that are really driving uh, a unique transformational moment in our healthcare system and uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the recent developments, again, from both the public and private sector that are trying to be even more explicit about their desired pace and depth of, of change uh, uh, in the healthcare system, in particular with regard to payment reform uh, and the migration from volume-based payment to value-based payment. And then, as I mentioned, I'll just spend a, a two minutes at the end uh, telling you a little bit about how we are uh, playing in that space uh, here at Evelyn. So on the first slide, you know, there are many factors that are driving uh, transformation in healthcare and making it for, uh, for my money, the most dynamic industry in the country and in the world right now. And some of those factors include technology and regulation and changing consumer buying patterns and disruptive innovation in general. Uh, those are forces that have, uh, have transformed and changed uh, other industries, financial services, media, uh, the airline the travel industry, uh, and they are uh, also playing a big role in, uh, in this um, uh, unique change in our healthcare system today. The focus of my remarks today, however, are going to be focused more around uh, payment reform, so ways in which public and private payers are changing their reimbursement strategies to focus less on, the, uh, on payment for the volume of care delivered and more for outcomes and affordability. Uh, and part of that involves a migration uh, toward uh, risk-bearing uh, payment mechanisms for providers. And so this is something that has, as you can see in the slide here, uh, going back a decade, uh, had uh, very little traction and is certainly contrary to the, to the traditional fee-for-service approach. But as we're seeing and as we're tracking this here at Evelyn, uh, that has grown significantly today and is, uh, will grow, we expect, by 3x between now and 2018. And with that, we'll, uh, our estimates are that uh, providers and health systems will actually be at risk for half of the nation's population by then. So really uh, stark change in the approach here and on a very uh, quick uh, path. So I want to jump to the next slide and uh, dig in a little bit more on Medicare's approach to payment reform. So in, uh, in late January, uh, Secretary Burwell at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services made a, a truly historic uh, announcement and commitment on behalf of Medicare. First time ever that Medicare uh, was explicit in its commitment to migrating its, uh, in Medicare fee-for-service, its payment mechanisms away from volume and towards value. Uh, specifically, they announced that by 2018, uh, more than half of their payments uh, to providers through Medicare fee-for-service will be in the form of a, uh, alternative payment models. Uh, just to give you a sense of, uh, I'll talk a little, in a minute about what those are, but to give you a sense of perspective here, in 2008, that number was effectively zero. And today, that number is in the range of about 15%. And so when we, uh, alternative payment models as defined by CMS and HHS uh, are not your traditional pay for performance uh, and other uh, value-based purchasing programs, if you will. These are real uh, payment reforms that include uh, accountability and ultimately financial responsibility on the part of providers for populations of, payment, uh, of, of patients uh, over a year or, uh, or over an episode that spans multiple sites of care where providers are be being held accountable for the total cost, quality, and care experience of the care they provide. And th those, those words are really important. Total cost, total quality, uh, and total experience are really moving away from a siloed individual approach to one that really focuses on the whole person. Uh, so that, that is the major market signal um, and, and unique in its, uh, in its uh, explicit nature of the, both the depth and the timing around it. Uh, so that certainly has uh, galvanized, uh, I think, quite a, quite a bit of interest and in, in movement in the market just with, with having the world's largest payer uh, come out and be that specific with where it's going. Let's click to the next slide to get a little sense of what's been happening on a similar path on the private sector side. 
So uh, there was a group of, um, of healthcare stakeholders that was uh, launched at the end of January as well called the Healthcare Transformation Task Force, a uh, group that I uh, helped pull together and continue to serve uh, on the board of, uh, that is essentially a group of providers, uh, payers, purchasers, patients, uh, and other partners for those stakeholders uh, that wanted to, uh, to, do two, to do three things to, to accelerate the migration to value-based care. The first was they wanted to send a private sector-based market signal. So in the same way that CMS and HHS were feeling that the pace of, of change and acceleration was being held back by uncertainty about how quickly the world was moving towards value, uh, these private sector actors uh, wanted to do the same. And, and there were about 25 or 30 in the group. This is just a uh, random collection of them. And you can go to the website hcttf.org to see the full group. Uh, so, but a critical mass here of uh, folks from each of these four P's, or five P's, if you will. Uh, so the first was send a market signal. Second was start to align approaches to value-based care. So uh, to the extent that uh, various payers or providers are either sponsoring or participating in an ACO program, are there ways to find more commonality than less to have the focus be on providers expanding the book of business and value as opposed to trying to figure out uh, methodologies and, uh, and the competing approaches. So uh, aligning uh, methodologies and approaches was goal number two. And, and the third was out of this work to develop policy input that's timely, uh, relevant, and actionable to make sure that the public, and the public payers, uh, both the federal and state level, can keep up with the pace of change. On the next slide, just a little bit more on the, uh, on the guiding principles. So you can see here on the, on the top in bold was really the market signal. So when, when the group launched in late January, each of the organizations made a, a commitment to shift 75% of their respective businesses to be under value-based care contracts by 2020. So you can see here it picks up on the goals from, from HHS, from the public sector, and actually takes them and exceeds them uh, going out a couple more years. And importantly, using an almost identical definition uh, of what value-based care is. So you can start to see a public and private uh, consensus around what real value-based care is. And again, it's, it's oriented around total cost, total quality, uh, and total experience for populations or for episodes. But then from here, I, I won't go through all of these, but essentially the group is trying to uh, help contribute to the design of programs that provide for reasonable returns, and importantly, looking to see total growth, total growth in healthcare costs not exceed the rate of growth in GDP. So it's not just about participating in these programs, but actually succeeding, while also uh, creating multi-payer participation and developing and equipping uh, uh, stakeholders with the tools necessary so they can actually succeed. Uh, quickly on to the next slide, uh, just a little more flavor here from this group uh, in terms of the work groups. So the, the heart of this effort is to develop uh, work groups that, that will seek uh, clarity and consensus and alignment on uh, discrete issues and uh, run to ground uh, consensus approaches in a very short order. So this has started with improvements to the ACO model, uh, including a, a public-private set of recommendations that are on the task force website and were the basis of their comments on the CMS Medicare Shared Savings Program proposed rulemaking. Uh, looking at developing some tools to allow providers to have a better understanding of bundle payment approaches and methodologies available to them and then digging in a little bit on uh, high-cost patients where there may be either a need for best practice sharing or perhaps new care delivery or payment models to support um, investment and, uh, and returns both for provider and patient for the sickest, highest-cost patients. So I'm going to wrap up here real quickly and get on to the other panelists. But uh, So in this changing uh, market on the next slide, uh, give you a sense of uh, what Evelyn is up to and operating, again, in long-term financially aligned relationships uh, with systems around the country. You can see in the, the sort of dark blue, uh, almost uh, black states are where we have um, you know, long-term uh, agreements in place today and are working in various stages with partners um, from all around the country. Starting to see some results here um, that are a proven concept that it's possible to take uh, pockets of excellence and in using and leveraging a national infrastructure that Evelyn is able to build to drive results pretty quickly. Uh, and then I'm going to just jump to the last slide and wrap up to give you a sense of how we're doing that. Uh, we have a suite of um, solutions that we develop in, and implement in conjunction with our partners that can range from uh, the kind of high-level 
strategic and operational blueprint or uh, strategy that can include helping to bring to market uh, population health and value-based care uh, strategies, whether that be with your own employed population for a health system, through risk deals with uh, other private payers, or developing and um, branding and, and bringing to market your own health plan. Uh, and then within the, within the population health component, the value-based services organization, uh, including uh, developing uh, best-in-class population health and clinical care programs, uh, aligning the delivery network, and, and also having a, um, kind of a unique technology platform that makes all this run and is able to, to drive uh, impactable, actionable results. So we do, in some, in some partners we work with, we uh, bring to bear the full solution, and in others, uh, we may be uh, executing against uh, one or more of, of the uh, individual um, capabilities that we can that we can bring to bear for the partners. So I'll wrap up there. Looking forward to the question and answer and, and the presentation from my other panelists. Thank you. Mitch, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, folks, uh, to the audience and the organizing teams at Beckers and Care Innovations. It's a great honor to be here with you today. Hope we can generate some great discussion from this session. Uh, my background, my college degree, biotechnology, graduate studies, health economics, five years in the pharmaceutical industry, ten years at GE. And as a quick primer, GE Healthcare uh, manufactures imaging technology, molecular diagnostics, healthcare IT, and biomanufacturing equipment. And so my team's role at GE, we conduct research to understand the value of healthcare technology, and we make forecasts about the global healthcare economy. So next slide, please. So here you see the two faces of accountable care. If you take a snapshot right now today, we see the ACO model has grown. So right now it's trending at about 18 million covered Medicare lives. That's about 6% of the U.S. population. Uh, right in line with the slide that uh, Chris shared and uh, potentially heading to a very large portion of the population covered. But at the same time, you see hospital margins declining and in fact being squeezed to historic lows. So next slide, please. When we talk with executives and administrators, providers of health care, uh, this theme keeps arising, this common theme, um, similar to what Sean was kicking off at the start, which is, how do I keep patients out of the hospital and keep the lights on inside? Keep patients out, that's accountable care, population health. That's the left-hand side of that graph I showed you, which is ACL growth growing. But the right-hand side, how do I keep the lights on inside? We are still um, halfway, one foot in the world of fee-for-service. Right? Half of a hospital's revenues are coming from fee-for-service. And so uh, we call this the new paradox. We think this is going to be prominent uh, on decision-makers' minds, on providers' minds, as they prepare for the future and look towards healthcare 2020. Now, in the old world, the hospital was the dominant structure on the hospital landscape, but see how the landscape has changed, right? All around the hospital now are new business models, new revenue streams, potentially eroding um, the hospital's revenue streams, potentially complementing the hospital and their uh, strategy for growth, okay? But you can see the landscape has changed. Next slide, please. One of the big factors that we see driving a new race towards productivity as uh, hospitals try to reconcile this new paradox is high deductible health plans. So over the past 10 years, um, high deductible health plans have grown from about 1 million of uh, the population to about 17.4 million now. So again, this is about 6% of the U.S. population. Um, high deductible in a fee-for-service plan that's defined as greater than $1,150 per individual or $2,300 per family. The key change with this change, uh, with consumers being more on the hook financially for health care, is what always happens when consumers are on the hook. Okay, number one, they want value, and number two, to get value, they need transparency. And so you can see the high deductible health plan model is beginning to disrupt uh, health care. People are more open to seeking care in retail settings or more convenient settings. And indeed, people are changing in their attitudes and in their uh, 
healthcare seeking behavior to look at alternate sites of care and they're becoming more um, quality savvy, more value savvy as they do this. Next slide, please. This is a second trend uh, that is underlying this race towards productivity and this is labor costs. Okay, so this study was published by the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics. There was a, a second study in the New England Journal of Medicine published in 2011 by Kocher. And these two studies have really had stunning results on the way we think about healthcare productivity. When you look at 20 years ago, okay, any healthcare worker, the number of tests they could perform in a given hour, the number of tasks, the number of procedures they could perform in a given hour, that number has not improved. Okay? The healthcare labor force has not become more productive over the last 20 years. And so how have we responded to increasing demand for healthcare? Well, that's the top gray line. We add more workers. We meet the demand by adding more hours to our labor. We don't make our labor um, more productive. Okay? So now this model is potentially no longer sustainable. So recall um, my first slide where margins are being squeezed to historic lows and also that half the cost of delivering health care is labor. Okay? Those two facts um, make it hard to see how we can continue with adding labor hours as a sustainable way to meet future health care demand. Okay? Now, bear in mind our relationship with health care labor is complicated. Health care is about 8% of GDP. Um, uh, forecasts are that healthcare will add about 5.6 million new jobs um, by 2020, so it's a complicated relationship. But this leads to a great policy question. Potentially, one of the great policy questions of the next 10 years, why hasn't technology transformed labor productivity in healthcare when it has done so in virtually every other industry? Okay, so think about the last time you called a travel agent to book a flight. When was the last time you drove to the bank to talk to a bank teller about withdrawing money, right? Now, granted, healthcare is more complex than other service industries. The offerings are more diverse, but surely there are tasks and tests that could be automated or offered remotely. Okay, so next slide, please. So that leads to these two forces that are squeezing hospital margins, right? You heard from Chris the change on the horizon about the way um, health care is paid for. Bundled, at risk, uh, complete continuum of care, right? Population health. It's changing and in addition, the fee-for-service model, which is still half of hospital revenue, the fee-for-serve model is being trimmed, right? Reimbursement rates are being cut across the board. Labor costs are very difficult to take cost out. So we think there's going to be um, a need for disruption and a need for new models. So uh, last slide, please. Part of the solution we think will be in the realm of digital health. So uh, healthcare IT, connected workflows, mobile health, remote patient monitoring, um, smart sensors, remote care management, really the broad rubric of um, digital health. We think this is going to be a key role in resolving the new paradox um, for two reasons. When you are tasked with keeping patients out of the hospital, namely keeping people healthy, you need to number one, closely monitor the costs that are happening in that bundle, and number two, report quality measures. So we think there's going to be a um, large need to underpin this with digital health and healthcare IT. Uh, the healthcare IT of today is more of a digitization of paper records. Um, the IT and digital health of tomorrow will need to be something different, right? That will enable these new trends that we're talking about today. So uh, that's my last slide, and back to the moderator. Thanks so much. Lori, you're up. Well, uh, just to tell you a bit about myself, my name is Lori Orlov, and I uh, founded Aging in Place Technology Watch and Boomer Health Tech Watch. Um, over the past five or six years. Prior to that, I was uh, nine years as an industry analyst at Forrester Research, and prior to that, I was 24 years in the IT industry where I was a CIO in a couple of my last two jobs. Um, if you could go to the next slide, I hope. There you go. Okay, so we're going to sit on this slide for a minute. 
the, the point of founding Aging in Place Technology Watch was really around the concept of successful aging, which uh, what is the definition of that? The ability to do things for myself, to feel safe, and to have good health. And therefore, aging in place is the ability to age successfully in your home of choice. So just to ground that, uh, because we really are talking about an awful lot of the healthcare system being devoted to uh, serving the 65 plus population, I thought I'd give you a few comments about that population. First of all, today there are 46.3 million people age 65 plus. There are 20 million people age 75 plus. 46% of the women age 75 plus live alone. There are 5 million people age 85 plus. Today, we have a new paradigm of life expectancy. That is, if you are a woman and you live to age 65, uh, on average, your life expectancy is now 88.8. .8. If you're a man, it's 86.6. .6. So that is pretty important context in which to think about the use of technology for older adults. And I also want to point out that before 2010, there was no iPad. Today, even the mobile personal emergency response industry, which is the ability to wear a pendant around your neck outside of your house and actually press a button and get help, that is still only 10% of that industry. That industry is, in fact, going to intersect over time with the smartphone industry, but today, uh, it has not yet done so, and it's still a $1.5 billion industry. The other thing to understand about the population that we're talking about is 27% of the 65 plus today have smartphones. That's up about 10% from last year. And 59%, according to the latest Pew numbers, uh, of the 65 plus have online access and go on the internet. I think uh, it's important to understand that when we look at this slide, which is about the um, categories of technology that are appropriately serving the 65 plus population. So if you look at the upper left-hand category, those are all the communication technology categories, including email, chat, games, video, cell phones, smartphones, tablets, PCs, and Macs. And every year I seem to add another to that list. If you look at the bottom left-hand, um, because we know that 60% of workers who are age 65 plus actually are still working full time, it's important for them to continue to hone their skills, to take courses online, to find work, and to volunteer. Not to mention they want to use technologies to help them leave a legacy of information for their families, grandchildren, and so forth. If you look at the top right hand of this puzzle, you'll see these are the safety and security technologies, which include personal emergency response, home security systems, fall detection, um, home monitoring, and inactivity monitoring, which unfortunately is still a very crude technology. We really, in every other type of te fitness technology, for example, we know how much activity you've taken and whether you, in fact, should get up and go out for a walk. But inactivity monitoring of, of older adults um, has not yet really um, become common practice and a common technology. So if you look at the um, upper, if you look at the bottom right, those are the health and wellness technologies. And it's important to uh, think about that, that list of technologies there and understand the need to have the adoption boosted among the older population. Maybe mobile health applications as smartphone adoption grows, uh, maybe as tablet adoption grows, but surely telehealth technologies for remote monitoring of chronic diseases, medication management to remind people to take their medications, um, and uh, you know all the kind of diagnostics that are possible for an older population. That is all um, really critical to helping people thrive in their own home. And so that is. Um, the last of my comments on the categories of technology. The only other thing I would say about this is the reason you see caregiving in the middle is that it overlays the four categories um, in that caregivers, that would be family caregivers and professional caregivers, uh, participate in all of the four categories of technology for older adults. 
they are they have a role to play, if you will, in helping people uh, leverage all the other technologies. And the other thought would be that the reason this is shown as a puzzle is because without one of these segments, whether it's communication, safety and security, learning and contribution, or health and wellness, if you leave out one of these puzzle puzzle pieces, in fact, it is much harder to age successfully and thrive. And that's all I have to say about that. Back to the moderator. Thank you. Well, I believe now we're going to turn over to Beckard to start fielding some of the questions that are coming in through the audience so our panelists can address them. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, presenters, for a very informative and enjoyable presentation, first of all. Um, we will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have for the Q&A, and we'll follow up on questions we do not have an opportunity to address. All right, so uh, first things first, um, we have a question here from the audience. Um, what disrupts labor today? Yeah. So it, uh, this really gets at a deeper question of, the, of technology and labor and how they work together in healthcare. Okay. So um, what disrupts labor today? What first gets disrupted by technology is routine tasks. Okay. That's where, that's really where practically labor gets disrupted. Anything that's a routine task that can be done um, automated or what's called consumer added value where you push over to the consumer, make the consumer do stuff on the web, right? Like book their own flights or make their own um, bank transfers, right? Um, those are the routine tasks that get disrupted first. The higher end cognitive stuff, and by the way, for everyone listening on the call, this is good advice for your kids, right? As you think about what are the jobs and skills required in the 21st century, right? Higher cognitive processes um, like diagnosis or actually performing a surgery that requires tactile sensation and it requires pattern recognition, those are not going away anytime soon. Right, there's promise of how technology will um, partner with us to get those higher cognitive tasks done. But any anything that involves um, routine is ripe for automation um, or outsourcing. Got it. Wonderful. Does, does anyone else uh, want to weigh in on that question? No. All right, uh, moving along to the next question then. Um, when do you expect the payment specific resources available? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the question is, when do you expect there to be bundled payment specific resources available? And that one is for Chris, I believe. Yeah, I can, I can, I can kick us off on, on this one. So I, I, I'll, I'll answer this in a couple of perspectives. From, uh, from the Healthcare Transformation Task Force because we have a specific uh, focus on, one of our specific focuses on uh, bundle payment, but also a note on uh, where CMS is headed with bundle payment. So the, our work group, uh, which, is, um, which is led by uh, Steve Wiggins from Remedy Partners and Rich Roth from Dignity, uh, and includes really a number of the leading lights in, in bundle payment uh, work around the country, uh, is in the middle of their first scope of work, which includes a really comprehensive environmental scan of all of the bundle payment work that's going on in both the uh, public and commercial sectors. So that is in the field now, and the expectation is that uh, this quarter that will come back and that will inform the development of a tool uh, that will be available in an open source format uh, in the second half of uh, this year. And so I um, would encourage you to take a look and follow up. There's a sign up if you want to follow the work and be kept uh, abreast of what's happening. But I would expect that, uh, again, in the uh, Q3, Q4 this year to have the development based on the both the environmental scan and the uh, uh, intellectual property that folks are contributing to the work group to, to be available for the broader public. And as far as CMS goes, um, as many folks probably know, this is bundle payment is a, a major focus of their work. Uh, alongside accountable care organizations, ACOs, as Mitch was talking about, and things like patient center medical homes. Uh, CMS is currently testing 48 different episodes of uh, bundle payment, 
that span both the inpatient uh, and post-acute settings. And uh, my, my sense on this is that that will be, uh, of all the models that CMS is currently testing, that one feels like it could be uh, most ripe for an expansion nationally, including in a ma mandatory way uh, in the next couple years using the full extent of the CMS Innovation Center's authority, authority to take a concept that they've been proven in the demonstration phase and actually make it the permanent uh, Medicare methodology without having to go back to Congress. So that one feels like it could be even in the next uh, 18 months or so uh, that you'd see CMS really doubling down on bundle payment for at least a portion of those 48 episodes. Wonderful. Um, the next question we have from the audience is, uh, when will value-based purchasing initiatives include emergency services? And, and again, I think that's for Chris, and he yeah. has answered it broadly, I think, in his previous answer. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, I may not, thanks, Mitch, and, and we encourage others to jump in here, but um, as, as, as I was trying to convey, I think the, the direction that public and private payers in particular are moving with support from providers and consumers and other, and other groups is to move towards an orientation around total cost of care. Uh, whether that be, again, in, in a population-based approach like accountable care organizations or capitation, other forms of managed care that have been around for a long time, or incre increasingly in this uh, bundle payment approach, the idea that emergency services would be included because it's, it's truly total cost uh, and total quality of care uh, and experience across the entire spectrum of, of care delivery. So you would expect, you, you will see emergency services be a part of that, those full bundles. Uh, I think there's less, seems to be less energy these days in, in creating specific site of care value-based purchasing programs. So I would, uh, I, I'm less, uh, uh, I think you're less likely to see that develop. It could happen on a payer-by-payer -payer basis, but I think the broad movement is more towards uh, bundles, whether uh, population or episodic. Got it. Would anyone else like, else like to uh, specify? Or? No? All right, so the next question we have for the panel uh, from the audience is, uh, what is the probability that the U.S. will move to a single-payer system? I mean, I can kick it off, and I think Chris is well positioned to follow up, which is we're already halfway there. If you look at the effect of CMS, so Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, children's health insurance coverage and VA coverage, um, there's a large portion of the United States is under um, what you could call a single-payer system. Uh, Chris, over to you. Uh, yeah, certainly the Medicare program uh, is, is a federally uh, financed um, and, and partly federally administered, uh, though certainly a, a large and growing portion of that is a public-private partnership with health plans through Medicare Advantage. Uh, and increasingly, as you see things like the development of ACOs, is really looking for provider-led solutions. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, Mitch, I would agree that a greater proportion, and you look at the states that, again, have some mix of um, publicly administered, all publicly financed, some publicly administered, and some administered with private entities. Uh, certainly the proportion of publicly financed uh, health care is on the rise. I would say that um, uh, I, I don't expect, quite frankly, to, to see much movement towards um, single payer for uh, for not non Medicare non Medicaid um, covered lives anytime soon. I think that would I think there's enough um, momentum in terms of implementing the the changes that we have in front of us now in terms of moving towards more uh, regulated and appropriate insurance markets. Uh, with things like exchanges and tax credits and the like to support the purchase of, of that private insurance. That, 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 that doesn't feel like something we're headed towards very quickly. I think. Wonderful. Uh, the next question we have, Mitch, it's uh, referring to a slide uh, that you had that displayed a hospital surrounded by a health center and um, numerous other businesses. Um, does this suggest that hospitals need to venture into other business lines? Yeah, you know, the slide was meant to convey how the landscape is changing. Um, certainly hospitals are very innovative in exploring new adjacent business models. You know, I think the first effect 
a, in the move to accountability is the merger and acquisition movement. So we've seen great activity with that over the last, uh, let's say, five years. I think it's fair to say the activity uh, of, of M&A and consolidation as providers try to ensure that they have a large, uh, large enough population base. Why do they need that? Because it's a way to manage risk. Right? When you are at risk uh, for the payment and for the outcomes, you need to have a large enough population to manage that risk. And so I think that's um, triggered a lot of the M&A activity of the last five years, which has been more than the preceding 20 years. And uh, I think that's the first, uh, if you will, business move. Uh, in terms of innovation and how they get into health and wellness, uh, there has been a lot of work previously in disease management. Um, we'll see now that incentives become more and more aligned. Um, how that trend plays out, but I would call it adjacencies and experiments right now in innovation. Great. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, the next question we have from the audience um, is, along the lines of labor costs, do you predict that there will be an emphasis on patient care techs and lower cost nurses like LVNs and ADNs uh, than BSN nurses? Yeah, so there's, uh, we, we call it the, the T's of labor. So um, you've got uh, technology, you've got task shifting, and these are, are critical in, uh, uh, in enabling uh, what is being described in this question. The third is the training, right? So the technology has to be easy enough um, for, uh, for labor to use. Um, task shifting is a bigger, it it's involves the societies, right, because what a certain healthcare provider can do is, is uh, regulated and defined um, by their societies. And so there's going to be a, a lot of due process involved in task shifting. Some, some tasks um, uh, will be more easy to transfer uh, than others. And then the third is the training. Right, so not only does the technology have to be easier to use uh, in lower skill settings, but the training has to accompany that as well. And so we'll need to see more commitment to both the innovation side and also the training programs that will effectively allow the task shifting to take place. But those are the three T's that will have to happen together, we think. Wonderful. Uh, the next question we have from the audience is, how will the industry and policy balance the financial and healthcare labor efficiency squeeze with the forecasted critical shortage of key clinical labor in this sector? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'll kick this one off, but I, I think that gets back to um, the need for a new model, right? So that, what that question says is that these trends are not sustainable, right? So the, the mm -hmm. reimbursement cuts in fee-for-service, the rising labor co costs, the squeezed margins is not a sustainable model, right? So how do we ensure that our um, care providers, number one, that the supply is right, and number two, that they're adding the best value, and the solution that we're all heading towards, certainly now on this call, and it seems to be where the United States is heading, is towards the accountable care model. And the whole purpose of that is to align incentives uh, for all um, providers on the team to coordinate care, reduce redundant tests, improve outcomes, reduce errors, reduce cost. So that's the, you know, that's the way it's going, how it will play out and how it will manifest in different moves and in innovation uh, remains to be seen. And others, please, uh, please contribute. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump in here really quickly. I mean, I think uh, implicit mission, what you're saying is that um, what this trend suggests is that uh, hospitals to survive and thrive and other health systems are going to need to get uh, closer to the healthcare care premium dollar, if you will, whether that be through uh, owning, owning that premium directly in the form of, of a health plan or in the way in which they are contracting with their payers. But the closer that the, uh, that the provider is to the healthcare care premium dollar, uh, the more opportunity and uh, there is to direct investments, including in labor, uh, it needed to, to achieve the triple AAA outcomes, um, which uh, I think in turn uh, creates a, a more efficient use of uh, and deployment of labor towards goals that, that serve the health system and the health and the healthcare organization that's holding that risk uh, for the for, uh, in the best possible way. So in some ways, I think that to the extent this uh, movement continues to accelerate. I think we're obviously seeing um, 
several trends converge here into a bit of a tipping point, uh, that's going to require uh, those in the, on the delivery side to be closer to that premium dollar, which will push them to make uh, resource, including allocation decisions, including labor, uh, towards the best possible outcome. You know, the one thing I would add to this question about the how is this is a case where we should look to Europe to see what they do to solve this as well. So the entire European Union, um, under obvious uh, fiscal constraints, right, have effectively capped their budgets for adding healthcare labor, right? And those uh, those economies, those countries being uh, more oriented towards um, single payer systems, are able to do that. What that has created is a forecast gap. If you project out to 2020, so the increasing demand for healthcare, driven by the demographics and a flat labor supply, creates what we're calling a productivity gap of about 15 percent. Okay, so to to address that by 2020, that's the equivalent of every healthcare worker across the European Union working an extra half day every week for free. Okay, now, do they solve it like that or do they solve it some other way? It's going to be very pronounced there. What this question is asking is it become very pronounced across the European Union and we should probably keep one eye on how they solve this problem of labor productivity as well. Um, this is Lori. I'd just like to jump in at this point and point out that to the degree that patients themselves can be more involved in uh, keeping themselves well and out of the healthcare system, you, you would obviously see a reduction in demand on labor. Um, however, I don't see patient portals as necessarily the way to make that happen, although maybe they have some potential over time. Um, but um, how to keep the keep people from having to go into institutions, which essentially puts that pressure on labor, I think that would require some level of thought and investment. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, the more complex uh, information technology gets, the more difficult it is for older and ill patients to access and adopt and participate in new technology and programs. Um, how are these issues being addressed as we push towards the adoption of healthcare information technology? Well, I, th I think I just uh, answered that before it was asked. <laughs> Does anyone want to expand on it? Yeah, um, this is Sean. Let me uh, poke at that from a little bit different direction just to add to it. One of the things that I've seen <clears throat> coming out of the wellness and behavior change space predominantly and then moving into the technology world is that most technologies, whether they're web-based, in your hand, something you wear on your wrist, what have you, they're typically designed from a function and technology builder's perspective with a little bit of human being psychology sprinkled in. What we've noticed over the last four or five years as these technologies mature and uh, engagement with these technologies tend to peak at certain age groups, um, companies are starting to understand that they need to understand human beings more and what motivate them. And the reality is you can get a lot of information from a person if they understand why it benefits them to give it to you. And that in some cases the actual use of technology isn't the answer. It may just simply be somebody answering a question on a survey, maybe on a tablet or through a phone call. And you can have as much information as you need as a care provider to take the actions that you need to take. And so one of the first things that we really focus on is do you really need technology to solve the problem and get the information you need to get from the person? Is there a way they're already used to that can get that for you in a cost-effective manner? And if not, then you move on to new technologies. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so you guys have all discussed uh, some numerous changes uh, going on in the industry right now. Uh, one of the questions from the audience is, how are doctors reacting to these forces of change? I'm sorry, how are they what? How are doctors reacting to these forces of change? I can kick this one off with how the doctor societies are reacting. So um, this is all published information now from uh, ASCO, so the Society of Oncologists, uh, from the ACC and the AHA which captures cardiologists, and um, they are getting more actively involved in two things. Number one, task forces to understand what is the true cost of providing our services in the context of a, of a full bundle, right? Number two, 
task forces around what is what constitutes a bundle. These are very interesting um, guidance documents and thought pieces that these three societies have put out uh, in the last year because uh, what it suggests is they are going to become uh, more proactive in helping to define what constitutes a bundle and what constitutes a reasonable payment for a bundle. I think that's a very, very interesting move on the landscape of um, how accountable care payments come together. Is the move of these clinical societies into the game and also all of these um, documents that I'm referring to, they mention cost effectiveness. Okay, so they say in, potentially what this could mean is that they will not only um, evaluate clinical outcomes um, when making um, guidelines, recommendations, but potentially at some point in the future, and this will take a lot of due diligence and a lot of task force work, but they could be moving towards um, uh, having, having opinions and having recommendations on cost effectiveness as well. Yeah, this is Chris. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. And, um, you know, I, one thing that we didn't get a chance to talk about today, which is also an important uh, new data point in this sense of a, um, growing momentum towards value-based care is uh, the uh, seeming strong likelihood that, that uh, the House and Senate will pass and the President will sign a, a pretty meaningful reform to the way that physicians are uh, reimbursed and paid through Medicare, uh, which has the full-throated support of just about every physician society, uh, and that policy requires physicians to migrate into not just alternative payment models, but risk-bearing alternative payment models by 2019 in order to receive any kind of an update on their underlying fee-for-service payment from Medicare. Uh, so at, at a high level, at a policy level, that, that's something that is broadly supported in the physician community. And I think that speaks to uh, the notion that uh, a payment model that rewards the type of uh, time and energy that you can spend in actually keeping people healthy and keeping them well and out of the hospital is the reason that many physicians went into the, their noble field in the first place, and it's a, it's a way of practicing that's not necessarily been supported by the, the economics of fee-for-service. Uh, and I think there's also a lot of interest in moving to more comprehensive approaches as opposed to five, six, or seven different types of value-based uh, purchasing at a kind of an incremental level. So at, the, at a high policy level, it, feels, it, it seems pretty clear that the physician community sees a lot of upside in this movement. Now, in terms of how it's felt on the ground, I mean, in our experience, there are a couple things. First is that for a health system, uh, we find you actually need to have a, a thing, a so-called thing as a value-based business, something that you can actually invest in, something you can put physicians in, uh, in leadership roles where they can actually uh, help design and implement changes in, in the approach to care delivery consistent with these new accountable payment models. Uh, and to the extent that, that physicians are, uh, are able to lead it and put their own stamp on it, and to the extent that it actually uh, improves their life on a day-to-day -day basis, I think there's a lot of emphasis on physician compensation, and that certainly is a, a huge factor. But uh, I think for a lot of doctors and, and other clinicians, uh, they, just, they want the, the system to work better. They want things that can uh, help them in their in their everyday workflow to to uh, do more and and do better for their patients. And so I think that there, to the extent that a health system actually invests in a comprehensive approach in a business within a business focused on value based care, there's an opportunity to deliver that. Uh, and, and the physicians will, you know, there's a uh, the folks at Geisinger coined the triple aim plus one. So not just better care, healthier populations, and lower costs, but also improved uh, clinician satisfaction. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, another question we have from the audience here. Uh, under the current reimbursement system, the cost savings does not seem to offset additional costs of an ACO plus the revenue loss from lower utilization. Uh, the question is, um, how do systems manage until the reimbursement method transitions period? Well, it's a good point. Yeah, I mean, if you look at is, yeah, the ACA. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think this, this is a, it's a it's a great example of a place where um, uh, the the kind of talk and signal setting, uh, particularly from CMS, is starting to translate down into actual policy change. So, in something like the accountable care the or the ACO model, I think the feedback from the field has been consistent uh, across not just providers but 
uh, other stakeholders, including consumer groups and uh, payers and others, which is that the current approach to the ACO, uh, particularly in Medicare, is one that doesn't have enough financial upside, quite frankly, to justify uh, real investments in care management, particularly at a health system level where, you, where your population health business is going to cannibalize to some extent your, your hospital volume, and what you need to do is uh, replace that with a growing market share of truly necessary services. Uh, but to make those economics work, there needs to be a sufficient level of return. That hasn't, that hasn't existed in Medicare ACO up until now, in our opinion, in the, the new Track 3 uh, in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, and particularly this new next generation ACO model that really replicates Medicare Advantage and its opportunity for full risk and reward uh, is one that I think solves that problem. The other, the other issues have been around you know, understanding and knowing your population ahead of time and what your benchmark is and having some ability to create tools and incentives for consumers to, to seek care from high-performing providers. So CMS is starting to recognize that, starting uh, in particular with, with the idea of this has, there has to be a business case here. And until you start getting up into the types of returns that they're offering now and uh, their newer models, Track 3 and Next Generation, and the, the financing really hasn't worked out. You know, the one thing I'd add to Chris that, uh, Chris's point about the business model that we haven't talked about yet is large employers and how large employers are negotiating to set up uh, or agree on centers of excellence with key providers across the country, right? So you hear about these um, uh, details in the press uh, more uh, commonly now, and uh, it's the idea that a large employer will contract with a provider to provide, uh, let's say, hip and knee, replacements or per, perhaps cardiac procedures, but it is a form of bundling, right? It is a f contracting to guarantee that we're going to fix um, uh, the patient or the employee's problem um, within a set amount, right? And so negotiating with these kinds of um, contracting models to essentially um, ensure that they have a supply of, of patients that are well matched against their, their capabilities is what I would call an intermediate step away from fee-for-service towards the bundling and, and um, full ACO model that we expect to see uh, with Medicare. Fantastic. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, the question we have from the audience is directed towards Lori. Uh, the question is, um, in light of the higher incidence of hearing and vision impairment in the population you know, over 75 uh, years of age, are there innovations currently being developed in senior home design and architecture to help those individuals age in place in their home other than you know, assistive devices like hearing aids and eyeglasses? Uh, you mean in specific innovations in the home itself? Uh, well, um, there's not a nationwide building code that would comply with accessibility in the home. So uh, at the moment, it's uh, incumbent upon the homeowner to modify their home in advance of meeting capabilities that a home could offer, including wider doorways, smaller thresholds, um, accessible showers, and so forth. So. Unfortunately, all of those kinds of things are still incumbent upon the homeowner. However, there have been some innovations, particularly in hearing, um, that provide alternatives for amplification that don't require the four or $5,000 hearing aid. Um, that would include the personal sound amplification product, which can be bought at retail for three or $400 and uh, provide really all of the amplification that a hearing aid does. Um, it simply doesn't uh, require an audiologist to tune it. Um, as for um, magnification and vision technologies, uh, other than the fact that any device you interact with, in fact, can be uh, support magnification and zooming, um, I haven't seen anything uh, beyond that. Wonderful. Presenters, thank you again uh, for your excellent presentation and for uh, participating today. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. This concludes today's program and have a wonderful afternoon.